Are you ready? Oh, for episode seven. Go. What is that in Star Wars? There is no Star Wars. It was a great documentary. Of course there was Star Wars. <laughs> Welcome to episode seven. The Force Awakens. Oh, I hate you. I hate you so much right now. I had a really good conversation with... not but... true. <laughs> it's not true. Um, I had a really good conversation with a guy at work. All of our conversations, they always end in some kind of deep philosophical area at some point, usually towards the end. But... Um, we had we, we had been doing business, 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 like important stuff that we'd have been talking about for the work for work, but eventually we had like thirty seconds left and he asked me about something and I was like, I hate that. <laughs> and I was like, I hate all of Hollywood. I told him, Now listen, we watched I ate all of it. <laughs> yeah. I told him we watched Little House on the Prairie and I loved this first season, the second season. Third season started to get a little too dra- dramatized and too like emotional and too and I was like that's my. That's where my starting ground is. Where it's like, Little House on the Prairie is too extreme for me, and and he laughed. And but but the 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 thing that I pointed out that he was like, I can really understand where you're what you're saying is, I believe that we as people learn through ideas, not ideas, well ideas too. But we believe we learn through stories. You look at how Christ taught. He taught in parables. Stories are so important to the way that we interpret the world, and when we go to movies and stuff, we watch we watch. And we just consume whatever Hollywood produces for us without any thought of like how it affects our the way that we think about things. And so I, I really when I meet when I say I, I dislike Hollywood, it, it comes from like a, a really sincere place. I'm not trying mm-hmm. to hate on things, but yes I am. I am trying to hate on things. I hate Hollywood. Thank you. I like when they all threaten to boycott making movies and T V shows <laughs> until Donald Trump is out of office. <laughs> you know, I really don't think anybody cares. You know. Yeah. I mean, some people do. I enjoy a good movie, but I can live without it. That's the thing is, I enjoy a good movie too. I, I'm not saying I don't enjoy Hollywood, but I do hate it. <laughs> oh. I hate what it represents and its ideology. I hate what it's doing to our society. Yes. Sorry. Today we actually do have a topic that's not Hollywood, and um, I did not mean to get us off on a rant. Well, I did in a little bit, but. Are you just distracting me? No. I thought it was cool. The cloud or was there a bird? The cloud. Yeah, it's beautiful. We have a topic. We actually did homework. <laughs> we, willingly. We willingly prepared for something. Yeah. <laughs> so today we are going to cover... Um, for the first part, we're going to talk about... The Constitution. We're going to go over the preamble, Article One, Section One, and Section Two, and then we have some other things that we're going to speak about today as well. Um, yeah. So we'll start with the preamble. Do you want to read it, or do you want me to? Um, you read it. The Constitution of the United States. We, the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. So, we'll break down what the preamble means. And do you want to give your breakdown first? Oh, yes, I'd love to. Okay, so the the first... three words we the people if you look at um from what i understand the i think it was the articles of confederation they it it references like we the states it has the it doesn't um identify actually the people and the the authority through which the constitution was created was the the power of the people and that's one of the things that's that that it's right there in the very beginning in the very preamble the very first three words um i think that that's really important because if we forget that where that authority comes from and that power comes from it's so it's so easy to think, oh, there's the president, or there's the senator, or there's the mayor, or whoever. No, it's the people that that power is derived from. And if you lose sight of that, then you're really um, missing missing the whole purpose of of our constitution. Um, the next thing that I wanted to point out is the the reasons for this constitution, and they're 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 pointed out right here in a very clear way. A more perfect union, establish justice. 
ensure domestic tranquility, provide defense, promote general welfare, and secure liberty. Those six things are the purpose of why they, the, the people came together to make this constitution. Um, and then it says also who that's for. And there's two people that, there's two grouping, two identified um, groups that it's for. It says for ourselves and our posterity. This is not a general document that's given to everybody. It's not an idea that anybody can adopt. The people fought for it and it's for the, themselves, the, our forefathers, and their posterity. And so that's, that's something that if we lose sight of that and we just say, you, there's rhetoric in, on the right right now, um, like Turning Point, um, what's his name? Charlie Kirk? Charlie, whatever. There, people are saying things like, um, the, United States, uh, the United States is an idea or America is an idea. And, and this, this notion that it's an idea is blatantly false and it's also destructive to what the Constitution stands for. That's that's my little rant. <laughs> Sorry. You're right. <laughs> is that your? Is that the end of your? Yeah. I mean, we could talk about like um, specifically what those those words mean, but I think you had a better breakdown as well for for breaking out the words. <laughs> I break it down for people who are simple-minded like I. <laughs> <laughs> or you describe it succinctly. <laughs> um, so the preamble acknowledges that that their current system of government is flawed and must be replaced. Um, and if you remember in the Declaration of Independence, they say that um, long-established governments should not be replaced, um, what's the word, um, lightly. I was going to say willy-nilly. <laughs> Flippantly, um, I couldn't remember yeah, that, either. And so, I mean, this is, anyway. It establishes justice and provides defense to secure the blessings of liberty, not only for themselves, but for their posterity. And then they ordain and establish the Constitution. And, and you know, ordination is a big thing in the church. For a lot of people who read this will understand ordination differently or define it differently because of how we experience it. But the definition for ordain in this in this instance is to order or decree officially. Order or decree officially. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then do you want to move on to Article 1? Yeah. Article 1, Section 1. So that's called the preamble. It's the first section of the, um, of the Constitution. The, then there's articles. It's, also, it's just like any other, any other thing that you're going to write out to be official or like when you do a, a paper in school or whatnot, you are going to outline what you're establishing and the reasons why. And, and that's why, I, I think that that's why it's, it's worth it to look at the preamble as like, it's, it's laying the groundwork for what's going to be discussed. And, and it's, it's very, very important. Um, Article 1, Section 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. You, can I go on? Like, uh, like rant? Can I? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the sole proprietor of this thing. <laughs> Okay. You can do as you choose. So, first thing I wanted to point out. Legislative powers vested in a Congress. Um, vested, I thought, was a very good term. And I looked up the definition of actually vested. Vested is secure in the possession of or assigned to a person. There were two, there's two places in natural speaking that I could think of vested, the term vested being used. One is in, they, we have a vested interest. It means you have skin in the game, that you have something that's pulling you towards that, that you need to, um, that, you, that you want to succeed. The second thing is like in financial areas, when you have your, when you start a 401k, oftentimes a portion is paid by your business, a portion is paid by you. And so you pay and then your, then your, um, the, the company that you work for or however you do it will be vested in it. If you work for the government, it's different. But um, so, so the question is like, it, is your 401k vested? And what that means is you are the owner of it. Like you, you can, it's, it's your money at that point. And so 
there, in both instances of that usage of the term vested, there is a personal stewardship that is, that is um, established or acknowledged. Um, and so that says the legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress. So the, 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 I, I think that that's, that's important to realize that there needs to be skin in the game. And, and especially when you look at like senators and stuff like that the, and, and our, our representatives, they need to be vested in this country. They need to be people who are want this country to succeed. Um, there are, it's it's unfortunate. And I, actually, there was a there was a um, I don't know what the political structure is in, in in Israel, but there was a guy that was being um, interviewed, and he was making fun of the U.S. Congress because of how many people in the U.S. Congress had citizenship as well in Israel. And he was like, "Why would you let a com why would you as a country let somebody represent you that is has citizenship in any other country?" And, and that's something that is really, um, it was kind of eye-opening to me. It was kind of like, wait, that does sound like it doesn't check, that, that doesn't check, pass the smell test. And um, are, are you pulling up? Yeah. Yes. I forgot to do it. Oh, you're fine. So um, m my wife is from Romania. She, she was born in Romania. She um, was a Romanian citizen. But um, we got married. We, uh, we got married in Romania. We moved here. And she first was a, um, was a she had a green card. She was, a, what is it called, resident... I forget the, the official term, but basically she she was a um, she could live here, and then eventually she applied for her citizenship. She had to take a test, um, which showed that she had a basic knowledge of the way our, our government works. And then she, at the end of it, she had to make an oath. And in that oath, did, did you already pull that up? Yeah, I got it. Read read that oath to us. And 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 before <clears throat> you read that, um, ask yourself when you listen to this: Is there any place there any wiggle room for? for a diverged loyalty is there any wiggle room for a loyalty that is not 100 percent well and we'll also on that note we'll find out later um through the constitution as we go on and cover it bit by bit every week um you'll find that the constitution also does not authorize or allow for dual citizenship or loyalty on our end mm -hmm. so the oath i hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince potentate state or sovereignty of whom which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law, that I will perform non-combatant services in the armed forces of the United States when required by the law, that I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by the law, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental res reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. That's beautiful. And... Well, if you if you notice in every single oath that has ever sworn um, um, allegiance to this nation um, in the military and in the public service, anything like that, you're always sworn to uphold and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I think that is of critical importance to note. It's also very critical to realize that even in the oath, it acknowledges that there are enemies to the Constitution domestically. It's, it's blatant. Pretty much anybody that gets elected. <laughs> unfortunately. Very unfortunately. Um, but what I was going to say, though, is as I was reading through, because I, I, we, we've been married for over 10 years. And not, not we. <laughs> but as, as I was going through and we were looking up the, all of the, get, basically getting all of our um, documentation ready, making sure all of the requirements were met, I read through the entire, everything that was on the, the government's website about how the immigration process works. And that I, I saw nothing there to indicate dual citizenship. And it's possible I just missed it. There, there, there is that possibility. I don't believe that's true, but it is possible. But people talk about all oh, these dual citizenship, and, and it's like, how do you have a, a split allegiance? How do you have a split um, loyalty? And it, it's very clear, like, are you willing to, like, you, you, that oath was, you will take up arms when required by law. You will serve in capacities that are nonviolent 
of the military when um, required by law. You will do these things that are basically you you forego every other allegiance. If if our if our people that we co- that we elect to represent us have a a dual allegiance, there's something deeply wrong with that. There's something deeply wrong with that, and so that's something that I I just wanted to point out. Well, it goes back to you're either an American or you're not. There's no room for split allegiance. There's, I mean, it's too, what we have is too important and too sacred to have a split allegiance to somebody else. If you want to have that split allegiance, you have to choose between the United States and our Constitution and freedom and liberty, or you have to choose your whatever other country you came from. I mean, yeah, it's fine. Honor your heritage and and uh, you know be be proud of where you came from. That's not a problem. But be an American. America, outside of God and your family, America should come first. But if you're looking at it realistically, all three of those things are of equal importance because they're all three connected. They help you. They help build each other. One of the things that um, that I wanted to point out, and, and you said it very well. You said, "Be proud of your heritage," and that's something that my my wife she will always be Romanian nationally. That's that's where the country she comes from. But that's the people she comes from, and she she there's there's nothing we can do that will um, discredit that or take away from that, and we don't want to. We want to celebrate that, but. She has also sworn her allegiance, and she took that oath seriously, that her allegiance is to the United States, and it's to our country, and to the Constitution. And yes, there's a, a large part of that is, I would probably say the majority of that is because me and her are married. If me and her weren't married, that, that would be, it would be far harder, I believe, it would be ha- far harder for her to make that, that jump. Um... Getting back to the, the Article 1, it notes that this, there's a Senate and a House of Representatives. Um, there's, there's something that, it, that I was, as I was researching this, there's something that came up that I really thought was interesting. In um, English law, or I don't know, English tradition, and if I say things stupidly, deal with it. Um, there, <laughs> but um, basically, the, so in England, they had the House of Lords, and then they had the House of the Commoners. And I think that I might have said the Commoners incorrectly. But basically, it was the aristocracy and the people, the common, common, um, well, the Commonwealth. Yeah, the Commonwealth people, I believe, is what they call it. But you had the aristocracy was designed as a people that, um, so the, the people who are rich landowners, like there's there, there's a distinction between the the aristocracy and the la- and the and the commoner. And there's a purpose for that. The commoner needs to have a voice. The aristocracy needs to have a voice. Um, one of the things that originally in the Constitution, and I think it was the 17th Amendment that changed this, but the, um, so the Senate, just to be clear, to kind of, and this is kind of going over a lot of Article 1, but um, the Senate, there's, um, there, was, there was this, when they, were, when they were designing this out, there was a, a disagreement on, okay, the, we want to go population based, and so there was the the big the states that had higher population. They wanted to if we could just go population based, then we can have more authority. But then there was the other states that were like, well, we don't want to we don't want to defer and become part of like a sub sub um, citizen to the popular states. And so every state was given two senators, and that's kind of a in rep- symbolic representation, not necessarily symbolic, but of of that um, House of Lords of that um, aristocracy. Every state is is viewed as equal, and that position, a senator, was was appointed. It wasn't elected, um, and the reason it was appointed was because you would have the people who had elected your your state representatives. They would get to know the people that were considered to be senators, and they would get to choose who they thought would represent them. They had a personal knowledge of it. Um, right now, we elect the senators, and there's there's goods and bads. But one of the negatives to that is. Now it's whoever has the most money to advertise, whoever can get their name out the furthest. And so it turns it, it, it has watered down the potency of the Senate to be a, um, this is, oh, who has the most money to advertise. And then if you can get the most names, then you can, then you can get that Senate seat. 
And that's something that, um, again, the House of Representatives, it's more based off of um, population. And so here in Utah, we have four um, members of the House of Representatives. But like California, what is it, 35, I think they have? Um, th th that, that is, it's, it's based off of population more. And so there is a skew, there, both parties, both the, the House of Lords and the House of the Commoners is kind of represented in a, in a way here. But here in America, we do not have an, uh, a, a identified aristocracy the way that they did at the time in England. And I, I think that's an important distinction. Yeah. Well, another thing uh, that is important to note um, in Section 1, a lot of people, and I was guilty of this at, at one point too, but a lot of people think that Congress is specifically just the House. Congress is both the House and the Senate. And so Congress is encompassing both of those, but you have the House, which is your, you know, congressman and whatnot, and then you have the Senate, but they are both combined Congress. And they're also, one of the things that's important to note is they're also given distinct authorities as well. Um, for instance, the House has the House of Representatives has the authority to start an impeachment against the president. Um, if I remember right, they're the purse. This is this may be rhetorical, but th that's what I've heard is that they're, they're also the per they hold the purse strings. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll learn more about that as we study more. And Congress declares war. Well, the the House the House declares, declares war. war. The and House then, declares war, which funny, funny, sad but true story. The Congress has not officially declared war since World War Two. Oh, that's not good. That's why we have a war on they've drugs. A, they've appropriated funding, but they haven't declared war. Officially declared war since World War II. But yet we've been in how many con uh, conflicts? Conflicts. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> again, one of the things that I don't think our founders foresaw was how Congress has abdicated their own authority um, to the different to the executive, but also to the uh, legislate or what do you call it? Judicial branch. Let's move on to breaking down well our notes on what that on what Article One means. I've, I've covered most of, mo most of my notes. Yeah, oh. that that was partially my tirade. <laughs> do I use that term too loosely? No, uh, no, I think it fits quite well. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so Section One. Um, grants legislative powers to Congress and establishes the House and Senate. You want me to read section two? Uh, you can or I can. I'll start. If I stop, then you t pick up. It's not that long, Fred. Where are you going to stop? <laughs> the entire thing is, the entire Constitution is not that long. It was on two pieces of parchment. Well, this is a really little book. You're right, it is a really little book. Okay. <laughs> the House of Representatives shall be composed of... Okay. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the, of the several states, and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requi requisite for electors of the most of the most numerous branch of the legis of the state legislature no person shall be a representative who ha who shall not have attained the age of 25 and been 7 years a citizen of the United States and who shall not when elected be an inhi in inhabitant of the state in which he shall be chosen representatives and direct Representatives and direct taxes shall be appropriated among the several states which may be included within the Union, according to, the, according to their rep respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of persons, of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians or Indians not taxed three-fifths of all other persons. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within seven subsequent terms of ten years, in such manner as they shall be law direct. They shall by law direct. The number of representatives shall not exceed 
one for every 30,000, but each state shall have at least one representative. And until each enumeration shall be made, the, the state of New Hampshire shall be entitled to choose, to ch what's that word? Choose. That's choose? That's how they spell it? Mm -hmm. Great. Choose three. Makes way more sense. It really does. C-H-U-S-E. Choose. Um, entitled to choose three. Massachusetts, eight. Rhode Island and Prov and Providence Plantations, one. Co um, connectivity, uh, sorry, Connecticut. <laughs> Connecticut, five. New York, six. New Jersey, four. Pennsylvania, eight. Delaware, one. Maryland, six. Virginia, ten. North Carolina, five. South Carolina, five. And Georgia, three. When vacancies happen to in the in the rep representation representation from any state and the executive authority shall theref thereof shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies the house of representatives shall choose their speaker and other offic officers and shall have the sole power of impeachment job Fred I'm proud of you thank you those are little letters <laughs> again that um, Congress did have the power of impeachment that's some or not Congress the House of Representatives did have the power of impeachment mm -hmm. um, did you want to go into that which part that they have the whole power of impeachment the whole section. No. yeah yeah so section two lays out <laughs> that the members of the House of Representatives are chosen every two years, um, establishes the age of 25, and you have to have been a citizen for seven years. It also says that you must be, and the, the wording is tricky um, because of the way that we speak now. Um, because, yeah, anyway. But it, it says that you have to be a citizen in the state which you're elected. Um, it also establishes one representative for every 30,000 citizens, but you shall have at least one, and vacancies are appointed by, or handled by special elect elections, and it establishes the sole power of impeachment. The other thing that I wish I would have dove into a little bit more, because people love to use the uh, three-fifths argument, three-fifths of any other people. That doesn't... Everybody says that they counted the slaves as three-fifths of a person, but it doesn't specifically say that. If that's what they meant, that's what they would have written. Enslaved peoples shall count for three-fifths I think it's funny the, every other person's I think but that's not what they wrote so that's not what that means I think it's funny how um, every time slavery gets brought up people assume that it's a racial there's a racial um, argument or there's a racial uh, injustice um, but if you look at how many slaves were uh, I Irish there were so many Irish slaves there were a lot of there was the, there was more Irish slaves than uh, black slaves at, at at different points, if I remember correctly. And maybe I'm wrong on that. I, I probably not, but it's well, possible. Uh, depending on the time, because um, there were I think originally there were more Irish slaves than there were um, black slaves, but later on down the road they started breeding them together so that they could get the best attributes of each i guess well the reason i read something about this a while ago about how how and what and why they did it but i don't remember it all i think that everybody that has there are people not obviously not everybody but i think that people of good conscience denounce slavery in any form that's it's just wrong and, and that's um that's not a hard argument to have because always has been and always will be 
exactly exactly um but it's also not unique to our country it's not unique to this part of the, this time of the world i mean look at how long um it's still the Jews alive were, and well and we're Parts slaves of in, in, in the oh, Middle East. In the Middle East, there's slavery everywhere. If you want to look at sex slavery, it's all over. Mm -hmm. You think it doesn't happen here in the states? You're wrong. If you think it doesn't happen, like it's it's there's there's some bad stuff that happens. And any time that people are given a chance to make choices, they're given a chance to do evil things. And they're evil people. You you have to be aware of that. Yeah. Are you going to cover your notes on that? What do you your takeaways no, from section two? Full disclosure, I <laughs> remember I didn't read through section two that well. I, I got I went off oh. on tangents on section one and what? the preamble because you? I got super excited. Yeah, I was like, whoa, what if this? What if this? You know, and yeah, I got super excited. I've never seen you get super excited, <laughs> ever. So that is for this week what we're going to cover of the Constitution. It actually drug on a little bit longer than I think either one of us had kind of anticipated. But it's important. Um, there's a reason why we're talking about it. There's a reason why we're doing what we do. Full disclosure, we don't... I, we, I don't think either of us consider ourselves experts really at anything. <laughs> but we definitely are on the path to learning and that's 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 why we thank you for for joining this path with us because um it's if we don't if we don't value and and know and are familiar with the constitution and the and the founding founding of our country we don't deserve our country like we don't we don't we haven't earned it and it's like we don't want to be there no i kind of value being free yeah. having the right to choose um, and I think with a lot of things that have been happening this year was kind of a big a big push for us definitely when we went and saw that uh, profits in the Constitution was that last final kick in the ass to we need to do more we need yeah we need to we need to talk we need to speak we need to discuss these things and help others understand um, and then I mean, it just it seems to get worse every week, especially the governor here is just mandating things and making requirements when when that's very that's a very dangerous road to go down. That's very dangerous and disturbing to allow that to happen because everything is based on the people what the people have to say and contacting their legislatures to enact laws and pass things um, and the amount of executive overreach and the abuses that the governor here in utah has gotten away with which is nowhere near as bad as several other states but it does. But it's it, it it's all ex, it's all executive actions and all executive powers, and those are bad. Those are wrong. Those should scare you. I was reading comments about Herbert's um, changing, and that's the thing. He he and the Utah Department of Health, which none of them are elected. I, I was actually reading, he's like, he's like, oh, our task force and this, I, I was reading through one of his things, and he's like, our task force and this, and he's like, our task force made up of this and this and this, and I was like, this is an appointed, this is an appointed um, task, like, uh, appointed, uh, as you said, not elected, they're not people representing us, they're people he chose to tell him what he wants to hear, so that he can make the choices he wants, and that's, Which so far, have the proved, power or the authority to just choose and tell us what we can and can't do. And it's like, who's going to stop him? If we don't do something, nobody. He'll just do what he wants. I just do what I want. That's how, that's how I fight back. Th that's... I had a lady in the grocery store here in town ask me a couple of weeks ago, excuse me, sir, where's your mask? I was minding my own business. You came and started talking to me, for one. But I just, I didn't know she was talking to me at first because I was minding my own business. Why the hell would she want to talk to me? 
right? No I'm way. I'm minding my own business. Why would you just, <laughs> like, anyway, she says, excuse me, sir. And I ignored her because why would she be talking to me? She says, um, excuse me, sir. So I turned around, said, yes. She said, excuse me, but uh, where's your mask? And I just told her, I said, I don't negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> she got all butt hurt. Went, <gasps> what? Anyway, but well, I mean, it, it, it's super easy to to um, to talk to people because, like, I was I went to Coles and there was a there was I mean, she was a pleasant girl at the front, but she worked there and she's like she's like we have a policy where you have to wear masks. Like, do you have a mask? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm I, I don't have a mask. Yeah, I don't and, even have one. <laughs> and, I don't. And she was like, she was like, well, here you go. I have one. You can have it. And I was like, don't give that to me. I'm not going to wear it. I was like, if I need to go, and I, and I and I was really polite to her. I was like, if you need me to, go, I I can go somewhere else if you want me to. But um, I'm not going to wear that if you, you know. And she's like, she's like, oh, no, just, just social distance and that'll be fine. And I was like, thank you. And, and I went in and I spent several hundred dollars on shoes and clothes and stuff for my kids. Drugs. <laughs> Coles, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but it was one of those things where it's like there's, there's been several times where people stop me. And you don't have to be rude. But you uh, don't, you'd also don't have to conform. Um, there was the, I, went to the, the, I went to a Sam's Club and the guy, the guy was like, he, he was like, well, you need a mask. And I was like, I, I'm not going to wear a mask. And he's like, uh, huh. And is I it, know is that it, your corporate it, policy says yeah. that you can't make me. I, he's like, he's like, is it something medical? And I was like, sure. That's none of your business. <laughs> for one, well, you can't ask me about that. <laughs> the, the lady that, there was a lady wearing a mask that was right in front of me. I just said, a, pers- a customer. And she, she waited for me when I went in and she's like, don't let him tell you anything. You can do whatever you want. And I was like, "Thank you, ma'am." Way to wear your mask. <laughs> yeah. Well, sure. yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna discredit or, or condemn people who, who feel like they want to, they're, they're doing it for themselves. So I'm just like, you know, if you think you need to wear a mask, I'm not gonna condemn you. I, I'm not gonna respect it either. I'm not gonna say like, oh, I'm very that's a virtue. I'm very indifferent if you choose to wear a mask. Exactly. If you choose is the key phrase there. Mm-hmm. If someone tries to tell you to wear a mask, choose with you. <laughs> it took me a minute to figure out what you're talking about. No, uh, you know, as far as that goes, when the store employees will say something to me, I'm nice and I'm kind and respectful to them because they're just doing their job and I understand it. Yeah. I get it. I don't care. But when somebody, just another customer or something, wants to ask me about it, that's when I kind of get a little bit angry. You know what? You mind your business. I'll worry about me. Um, and. And, you know, that's when I, that's when I kind of go off the rails. I, I told my wife, I said, after Herbert said that in the high risk and moderate risk areas, masks are required. I said, I'm not going to wear a mask. I have it this whole time. I'm still not going to. Requirement be, excuse me, requirement be damned. And I told my wife, I said, the next person who asks me where my mask is, they're going to get a big old F off right in their face because I'm sick of it. Well... I guess one of the things I also I went to a baptism um, from for some mam- family members just recently, and um, I went to participate in the confirmation. And there was old people there, and they were wearing masks, and I put on my mask. And I I I chose to wear my mask in that instance because one, I was invited to join something that I was not the leader of. I was invited to to participate, and and I I personally I felt out of respect to those that were there that I, I wanted the the spirit to flow. I wanted the I wanted to not have unnecessary conflict and I, I, I wore my mask for that, that time cause I was close to people and it was, it was something that I chose to do and it, well, I wasn't told to do it just to but, avoid the fight. <laughs> well, part of it was to avoid the fight, but part of it was because, you know, I, like I, I had some family there that some of them, obviously they're old and they are, have concerns and I didn't want to, it was, it was a situation where I was like, I didn't want them to feel um, forced to be around me. And I, it was just a choice that I made. But it's, it's one of those things where it's like, it's, you got to look at things like realistically and in all senses. And so it's like, don't, don't think for yourself and for, for each in, 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 in instance, in my opinion. But don't, I don't know. Don't hate. Don't don't produce. Don't try try to. A, a union is when people come together, and that's I don't know. 
just to give a, a, a counterbalance to that that idea. I, I personally, I don't think that there is use in wearing masks. I hate the fact that my kids are forced to wear masks to go to school. Um, that actually, I, I, I have a six-year-old daughter. She she took a water bottle to school. We um, we usually have a water bottle that she has, but she didn't. She either left it at school or something. And so I gave her just a plastic one that was, you know, uh, from the store. She couldn't open it. She wasn't strong enough to break the seal on it. And she asked her teacher to open it for her. And her teacher's like, I can't touch that. She went all day. She's not allowed to use the water, bo- the water fountains at school. She went all day not having a drink. And she was just like, okay, I just, I'm not allowed. And that's what her attitude was. And I was pissed. And, um, then a few, uh, a few weeks later, she, um, she sneezed in her mask and it was one of those things where it was like, it wasn't a little sneeze. And it was like, I could see the attitude where she was like, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to. She's a six-year-old. She doesn't have the, the knowledge of life to know all of these different things. But when she got home, I touched the outside of her mask and my fingers were wet from the snot in her mask. And I was pissed. And I was not happy about it because she didn't know that, oh, maybe I could just go to the bathroom or maybe she didn't know how to solve the problem. And because of the situation we as adults have put her in, she sat there with a a, mm, snotty, snotty, gross gross rag on her face all freaking day. And it was like, I wouldn't let my toddler run around with poop on his bum. I would, I would want to clean him. I would want to make sure that he's, it's just, it's normal. It's natural. It's, it's not healthy to, to, to live in your own uh, excrement. Filth. Yeah, filth. filth. And, and the same thing with masks. Like, it's, it really is something that, that is very, at the very least, it's disappointing that our government is, is enforcing it on public schools. Well, the children are, as always, the children are suffering the most. They're the victims of because this. Because they... And I tell my kids all the time, I say, you know, if you're at school and you want to take your mask off, go for it. If they have a problem with it, you tell the teacher or the principal or whoever to call me and we'll have that discussion. Because the rights that apply to me also apply to you. You're an American citizen. You have the same rights that I have. Whether they want to say you can or not. And this whole... (sighs) This whole idea that the school district has the authority to tell me what my kids can and can't do at the school and what I can and can't do at the school when I pay for it. It's my building. It's my money that supports the whole damn thing to tell me what I can and cannot do and what my children have to and have and cannot do pisses me off. And it should. Because that building is mine. Those teachers work for me. And I don't don't necessarily blame the teachers. So if you're a teacher and getting butt hurt, then... Well, too bad. I'm not really talking about you. But the district employees work for us. I mean, this is all our money. This isn't the district's money. It's not the state's money. It doesn't belong to them. They took it from you under the threat of force, and then they use it. And then they have the audacity to tell you what you can and cannot do. You should be furious. And to take it out on your children and say that your children are basically subject to the state is wrong. Uh, and it gets it and gets infuriating. Gets so bad when it, when maybe we'll go into a education sometime. But mm-hmm. when you look at the different things that are enforced, as far as like the sorry, I'm gonna go off on tangent. We won't. We, we'll, we'll another day. Another day. <laughs> but all that all that being said, and um, I actually went through the trouble of writing down how. Uh, how um, mask mandates and requirements are unconstitutional because you hear all these people say, well, it's not the Constitution doesn't have a problem with face masks and blah, 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 when that's just a damn lie because the entire premise, you know, the, 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 the Constitution, the way that our government was set up is predicated completely on people having the power, having the right to choose. And so for people to say yeah it's okay for them to require a mandate it's absolutely not and so the ways that mask mandates violate the constitution first and foremost the government should leave citizens alone that right there is reason enough number two it interferes with your freedom of speech 
either to communicate because some people are deaf enough that they require you know lip reading which half the time if I can't see somebody's mouth moving I can't understand what they're saying um, plus I have the right to not wear a mask in protest of their trying to control what I say and what I do um, uh, it also interferes with the freedom of religion and people ask me how does that interfere with the freedom of religion if you're LDS well what is our entire religion about when you boil it all down to what is it about it's about agency the right to choose right the right to ch make the right or wrong choose the choice you have the ability to choose and that's what it's all about so to say that I have to wear a mask is a violation of my core belief of agency being able to choose whether or not to do something. It also interferes with the freedom of association. Right now, if you live in a high risk or moderate area, you can't be in a social gathering of more than 10 people. Well, this is the United States of America. Last time I checked, it still is. Wait, wait. Unless you're, perf what was it? There was there unless was it's a unless a you're performing, performing yeah. something so stupid, so stupid. It's like it's like we're gonna make laws for everything except for this because we'll know we'll get too much backlash. It's like no, you're 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 trying to nickel and dime the people. Yeah, that's not what you're elected to do. Speaking of nickels and dimes, how much of my money have you wasted with this nonsense? It's a freaking cold, the super cold. There's always going to be viruses that kill people. Always has been, always will be. For an example, your DNA is 25% composed of dead ancient viruses so that you don't get them again. <laughs> it doesn't kill you. I did not know 25%, that. or maybe it's 23 But, I mean, a significant portion of your DNA is dead ancient viruses. The best way to beat something is to get it and move on and survive. Oh, no, don't you know you can get it again? That's what they're saying? That's what they're saying. Well, that's, the, and some people so some people have either forgotten, but I remember learning this in school. And I'm dumb. Like And if you learned it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I am not bright. <laughs> but you're plenty fun. I remember I remember learning in school that you don't catch the same virus twice. You don't catch the same bug twice, period, bacterial or viral. Because your body builds up an immunity to that. And if it comes back in, it just, it has, you know, no power to, to really sink in and, and set up. First, I would say the appeal to what you learned in school is an appeal to authority. <laughs> and if you think that everything you learned in school is correct, you're surely mistaken. Yeah, but. Secondly, I would say, I agree with you. That's science. <laughs> Well, yeah, Again, uh, yeah. authority. <laughs> but, but that's the thing is like the whole reason, the whole reason that we have this idea of vaccination is because when they went through and they found out that the, what was it? The, 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 uh, milk maids, who, who is it? The people that got, were on farms, the, they, um, they yeah. got, they got this, the, got the cowpox, the cowpox. And it was, a, uh, and, and because they got the cowpox, they were, didn't get smallpox. they didn't get smallpox. That whole concept has been, has been very, very well researched and like it's it's one of those things where it's like oh but if you get it again you'll if you if you get the coronavirus you can get it again and it's like the coronavirus is cold yeah exactly there's so much there's so much that is used the common cold is to the get you scared because when you're scared you make bad decisions well and everybody's gonna sit there and they're gonna they're gonna spew the uh the death tolls okay so there's been 300 something cases in utah right Almost 400,000. I think we're creeping up on 400,000. I don't really follow the numbers because I don't really care. Mm -hmm. It's been a while since I looked But there's up. been four or 500 deaths. That is a very, very small percentage. The, the, the percentages, I believe, are smaller than the per percentages for cold deaths. I have, a better, I have a better chance of winning, winning the lottery having not bought in a ticket. That I do have died from the coronavirus. I don't know if that's true. That is damn true. That's Science is proven. <laughs> Where's your lab coat? I keep trying to remember to look on there and get lab coats so we can do that one day. But Someday we'll do that. That'll be. We'll have a great, great but, time. 
But yeah, anyway, so moving Keep on. Keep going with your tirade, I like it. <laughs> My tirade. It also is interfering with your freedom of movement. Once again, going back to, um, yeah, I can go, I can not wear a mask and go wherever I want. I pretty, and I do that. But they're not going to let me into any federal or state building without a mask. Which, for one, those are my buildings, your buildings. They're all of ours. Um, and if you remember at the beginning of this whole thing, they're saying, you have to stay in your county. You can't go anywhere else. I, I, I can go and do as I please. I never looked into this, but a buddy of mine was telling me how Utah had some kind of a tracking on your phones mm -hmm. where if you left this, the, country, the state and then came back in the state and there was two frequency or something like that, mm -hmm. you would get a message where it was something like, hey, you've been... Why are you here? Yeah, that is a gross, gross... Um, well, it's an example of how, how little our privacy power. is, but that's a gross abuse of power. Because... And we'll cover this again in the Constitution later when we get to it. But the Constitution states that as a citizen of the United States, you are a citizen to the state in which you live. But there's the Protections and Immunities Clause, which says that you are allowed the same protections and immunities that a, the citizen of the state you're visiting, those also apply to you. So... If Utah's not going to make me fill out a travel declaration when I come into my own state, they cannot, by law, ask somebody else what they're doing there. Not only that, it's none of their damn business. You know what was first on our, curren on our currency? Hmm. Instead of in God we trust? Hmm. Mind your business. Really? Mm-hmm. I did not know that. <laughs> Mind your business. I love that. So, moving on. Mind your business. Mind your business. We gotta get shirts or hats or something because I love that. <laughs> I like to tell that to people too. Hey, what are you doing? No, mind your business. <laughs> I'm worrying about me. You try and do the same, all right? Yeah. Um, moving on. And my third point was it de denies procedural fairness to persons affected by the exercise of public powers. So, because in this instance where we live, a very, very small majority of people are scared of this thing and want to wear masks. That they think that they should be able to force and legislate that I wear their fear. There's a concept that he's, has... This has, is not a democracy. Yeah, there's a concept that's spread, and it's... Um, I'm trying to remember the exact... Was it, is it suburban wives? Or it's something... And it, it sounds a little bit derogatory. It's kind of funny. But um, basically, it's like a lot of the policies that we have as a government, our, our governmental policies, are driven by... Um, by the fear of, of like, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say just women, but it's like, <laughs> it's, um, there's, there's like a, there was the story I was, uh, I'm, this is, it's tickling my brain and I wish I knew it exactly, but, um, basically there was a, you should see a doctor. <laughs> there was a, there was a, um, a lady and she was like in, in her, in her neighborhood. I don't, I don't know if it was the mayor or somebody, it was, it was a local thing, but she basically got mad at some of the kids in the area that were doing something. And she like complained enough to the, um, to the local mayor or to the, whoever the city council or whoever it was. And they passed a law that basically like a lot of the, uh, it, it was, it was a small story, but it illustrated this thing that this, this phenom phenomenon that happens on a more grander scale where it's like the, this, this fear of a select few motivates and pushes our policies and pushes our, the way that our government's focused on. And it's like, that's not, that's not the way that it's meant to be. I'm sorry. Continue what you were saying. I, I apologize. <laughs> uh, the fourth point, it inappropriate, we already talked about this, it inappropriately delegates legislative power to the executive. The executive is not supposed to have any real power in any branch of U.S. government. When From you're... city, city, county, state, to federal, the executive of each of those areas is not supposed to have any real power. They're you know, I, I don't want to say a ceremonial position, but they kind of are. Kind of. But the, the the thing is, they had just they had just rebelled against the king of England. 
the had, most powerful they, empire the world had ever seen. They had wanted, they had intentionally made the executive to have little power. Mm -hmm. Which and we've allowed them to usurp that power back. That's to, that abdication of authority. Abdication, that's a good word. Abdication. Yes. So, we already covered, and it should be pretty plain why it's kind of dangerous and disturbing for an ex the executive, one person, to hold so much power. Five, it authorizes the commission of a tort, and a tort is a wrongful act or an infringement of a right other than under contract. I don't know what kind of situation that would be, but it le leading to a civil legal liability. Hence, in other states, they don't do this here, thank goodness, because I think Utah, outside of Salt Lake City, is way too red to let that kind of shit fly. But you look in other states, they were arresting people for not wearing masks, not social distancing. I mean, arresting people. There was a... There was a for nothing. A violent arrest um, that, that it, where the, the, the cop was... Um, he was like basically str had the... He was strangling the person that was getting arrested, and they were like, this is... It's just a mask! Like... And, yeah. People just, they, they're, they're just going nuts. Mask. Just a mask. No, it's ridiculous. This is exactly what they want, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all going to plan for somebody. It's not me. It doesn't work for my benefit. Um, and lastly, it interferes with any other similar right or freedom. One thing. So that's pretty in all encompassing. I mean, it is a blatant violation of your rights to mandate and require masks. You said you said just a minute ago. You said not me. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't. How did you say that? Not me. I don't know. It doesn't uh, benefit my. I wasn't even paying attention to myself. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you it basically doesn't said, benefit. Yeah. It doesn't benefit yeah, yeah. me. Yeah. It doesn't benefit me. And I disagree. I disagree. And it was one of the things that I was thinking. The is mask like, mandate. Yeah. It benefits me. Yeah. One of the reasons that it benefits you is because it is waking people up. It's getting people to be awake to what is going on. We wouldn't be doing this um, podcast if we didn't clearly see how the government is infringing on our rights and how we need to stand up and, and first off, educate ourselves and ha encourage everyone that we can to, to do the same and also to, to defend those rights. And so it is, it's, not for your, it's not for your benefit. That's clear. Yeah. It's not done for your benefit. But nothing is anymore. Nothing, nothing. They want to make it look that way, but it's not for your benefit. It's for their, for theirs. Yeah, but that's the thing. Is like everything that people do to try and control you or do bad things, you know. The the hand of God cannot be stopped. Like it's 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 as long as we align ourselves with with freedom, with God, with Christ. As long as we are aligning ourselves with the side that we know wins. Everything that they do to thwart our efforts will fail, and it might—it won't be in our lifetime. It won't be in—it uh, it might not be, but our actions now are are priming the ground and and making it so that our children will have a better life and more freedoms than we currently have, and that's that's what we want. To take that, to take that back. Exactly. To take our freedoms and our rights back. Exactly. It's like we've talked about, and we always. I always use the Second Amendment as as a um, point in case for for that. Mm -hmm. But it also they've done the same thing to the Fourth Amendment, which is unreasonable search and seizure. Um, I mean, if you if you were to actually go through, read all your rights, and understand them, and understand how they're being violated, you should you would be appalled. And I guess the thing, the reason that I stopped you on that and the reason that I said I disagree and the reason I kind of made a little tissy fit is because, like, it's easy to get down and to be depressed about, oh, look at all the things the government's doing. Look at all the things that are going wrong. But that's also a trap. That's also, that's also a design to try and get you to realize or to, to lose hope. And there's, there's, this, there's this Romanian saying, and Romania went through communism. It went through some of the worst... Um, governmental abuses of power that have existed on the earth and it was it was um speranza muare ultimo which means faith is last to die or uh, hope is last to die hope is last to die and it's like if if you start losing hope then look at what you're doing and like 
question yourself like, okay, where am I giving in? And that's because because hope shouldn't be it shouldn't be lost. It shouldn't be. Um, we need to not allow that to happen because that's that's what that's if Satan can get a, get us to give up our hope and give up our our trust that that God will prevail, then he's he's won most of the battle, and that's that's something that you got to be very careful of. Hope is a powerful tool. Absolutely. Absolutely. What uh, were your tirades that you wanted to go off on? Last, lastly, I wanted to... There was somebody that shared on our Facebook page. Again, you'll get... Um, if, if, you, if you have seen our Facebook page and you haven't joined it, or if you haven't joined our Facebook page, there's, there's, there's some really good content on there that um, we, don't, we don't get into all of it. But a guy shared a we story. Would like we would like to. But um, there was this one. Is, it's, it's a rather long story, and I wanted to read it because it, it is so good. Um, and it's of Davy Crockett. And I looked up the story itself. I, I didn't find it from the exact place. I don't have Facebook on my iPad here. But um, it's... Do you, do you mind if I read it? No. Do you want me to give any other background before? I'm just going to go. Care. Just do whatever. <laughs> Is government charity really theft? One day in the United States House, House of Representatives, a bill was taken up appropriating money for the benefit of a widow of a distinguished naval officer. Several beautiful speeches had been made in its support. The speaker was just about to put, in, put the question when Davy Crockett arose. Mr. Speaker, I have as much respect for the memory of the deceased and as much sympathy for the suffering of the living, if suffering for the, su for the sufferings of the living, if suffering there be, as any man in this house. But we must not permit our respect for the dead or our sympathy for a part of the living to lead us into an action of injustice to, to the balance of the living. I will not go into an argument to prove that Congress has no power to appropriate this money as an, as an act of charity. Every member upon this floor knows it. We have the right as individuals to give away as much of our own money as we please in charity. But as members of Congress, we have no rights to do to no rights so to appropriate a dollar of the public money, some eloquent uh, of the public money. Some eloquent appeals have been made to us upon the ground that it is the debt due the deceased the deceased, Mr. Speaker. The deceased lived long after the, clo the close of the war. He was in office to the day of his death. And I have never heard that the government was in ar arrears to him. Every man in the house knows, knows it is not a debt. We cannot, without the, gross, the grossest corruption, appropriate this money as the payment of a debt. We have no... We have not the semblance of authority to appropriate it as chair as a charity, Mr. Speaker. I w I have said we have the right to give as much money of our own as we please. I am the poorest man in this floor. On this floor, I cannot vote for this bill, but I will give one week's pay to the object. And if every member of Congress will do the same, it will amount to more than the bill is, than the bill asks. He took a seat. He took his seat. Nobody replied. The bill was put upon, put upon to its passage, and instead of passing unanimously, as was generally supposed, and as no doubt it was, it would, it would, but for the speech, it the speech it received, but few votes, and of course, and of course, was lost. So th they had the vote. Um, Davy Crockett. He basically said. We don't have this authority, but I'll give I'll give a week of my I'll give a week of my pay to to for the widow, and um, because of his words, they were moved and they didn't pass it. Later, when asked, so getting going on. Later, when asked by a friend why he did why he had opposed the appropriation, Crockett gave this ex ex explanation. Several years ago, I was one evening standing on the steps of Cap of the Capitol with some other members of Congress. When our attention 
was attracted by a green light over the over Georgetown. It was evidently a fi- a large fire. We jumped into a hack and drove over as as fast as we could. In spite of all that we could that could be done, many house many many houses were burned and many families made homeless. And besides some and besides some of them had lost all but the clothes they had. The wealth the weather was very cold when I saw so many women and children suffering. I felt that something ought to be done for them. The next morning, a bill was introduced appropriating twenty thousand dollars for the for their relief. We put aside all other business and rushed it through as soon as we could, as soon as it could be done. The next summer, when I began to, when I began to be time when it began to be time to think about the election, I concluded I would take a scout around among the boys of my district. I had no opposition there, but as the election was some time off, I did not know what might tur- what might turn up. When riding one day in a part of my district in which I was more of a stranger than any other, I saw a man in a field plowing and coming fo- toward the road. I gauged my gait so that we should meet as he came to the fence. As he came up, I spoke to the man. He replied politely, but as I thought rather coldly. I began, Well, friend, I am one of the unfortunate beings called candidates, and... Yes, I know you. You are Colonel Crockett. I have seen you once before and voted for you the last time you were elected. I suppose you are out electeering now, but you had better not waste your time. You had better not waste your time or mine. I shall not vote for you again. This was, this was a slock, this was a sock dog dolliger. This was a sock dolliger. I love the way he talks. This was a sock dolliger. I begged him to tell me what was the matter. Well, Colonel, it is hardly worthwhile to waste time or put or words upon it. I do not see how it can be mended. But you gave a vote last winter, which shows that either you have not capacity to understand the Constitution, you're too stupid to understand the Constitution, or that you wanting the honesty and firmness, you wanting the honesty and firmness to be guided by it, that you're not honest enough to be guided by it. In either case, you are not the man to represent me, but I beg your pardon for expressing it in that way. I did, I did not intend to avail myself of the privilege of the, constitu, of the consti, constituent to speak plainly to a candidate for the purpose of insulting or wounding you. I intended by it only to say that your understanding of the Constitution is very different from mine. And I would say to you that but for, your, but for my rudeness, I, would, I should not have said that I believe you to be honest. I believe you to be honest, but an understanding of the Constitution different from mine. I cannot overlook, because the Constitution, to be worth anything, must be held sacred and rigidly observed in all its previous, in all its provisions. The man who wields power and misrepresents it is the more dangerous, the more honest he is. I actually put that in my notes, that that sentence right there. The man who wields power and misrepresents it is the more dangerous the more honest he is what that means is someone who is someone who is honestly trying to wield power but doesn't understand the power that they wield are far are, are even more dangerous because of their honesty and it, it, I, I, it's beautifully said but but the sentence before that he says that um, the Constitution to be worth anything must be held sacred and rigidly observed in all its provisions that's beautiful okay this is what the so this is what the the person the guy plowing his field was saying to davy crockett he's basically like you're you're either too stupid to understand the constitution or you're not honest enough to follow it and then he's like oh i'm sorry i was i was a little harsh there but you understand the constitution differently than i do and and then here's what davy responds i admit the truth of all you say but there must be some mistake about it, for I do not remember that I gave any vote last winter upon the, any constitutional question. 
no colonel so that that was davy crockett and then the the man in the field responds no colonel there's no mistake though i live here in the backwoods and seldom go for go from home i take the paper from washington and i read very carefully all the proceedings of congress my papers say my papers say that last winter you voted for a bill to appropriate twenty thousand dollars to some sufferers by a fire in georgetown is that true well my friend and this is his response davy crockett's response well my friend i may as well own up you have got me there but certainly nobody will complain that a great and rich county like ours should give the insignificant sum of $20,000 to relieve its suffering women and children, particularly with a full and overflowing treasury. And I am sure if you had been there, you, had have, you would have done just as I did. This is the man's response. He says, it is not the amount, Colonel, but I complain uh, but I, but I complain of, it is not the amount that I complain of. It is the principle in the first place. The government ought to have in the treasury no more than enough for the legislate for its legitimate purposes. But that has nothing to do with this question. The power of collecting and distributing money at pleasure is the most dangerous power that can be entrusted to man, particularly under any under our system of collecting revenue by a tariff which reaches every man in the country no man no matter how poor he may be and the poorer he is the more he pays in proportion to his means what is worse it presses upon him without his knowledge there the where the weight centers for there is not a man in the United States who can g ever guess how much he pays to the government. So you see the why that while you are contributing to the relief of one, you are drawing it from thousands who are even worse than off than he. If you had the right to give anything, the amount was simply a matter of dis of discretion with w with you. And you had as much right to give two million as twenty thousand. If you have, if you have the right to give to one, you have the right to give to all. And as the Constitution neither defines charity nor stipulates the amount, you are at liberty to give to any and everything which you may believe or profess to believe or, or profess to believe is a charity. And to any amount you may think proper, you will very easily perceive that a wide door, you will very easily perceive what a wide door this would open for fraud and corruption and favoritism on one hand and for robbing the people on the other. No, Colonel. Congress has not, has no right to give charity. Individual members may give as much of their own money as they please, but they, but they have no right to touch a dollar of the public money for, the purpose, for that purpose. If twice as many houses had been burned in this, in this county as in Georgetown, neither you nor any other member of Congress would have, that, would have thought of appropriating a dollar for our relief. There are about 240 members of Congress. If they had shown their sympathy for the, suffering, for the sufferers by contributing each one week's pay, it would have made over $13,000. There are plenty of wealthy men in and around Washington who could have given 20000 without depriving themselves of even a luxury of even a luxury of life the congress the congressman chosen is um the congressmen choose to keep their own money and um money which of re which if reports be true some of them spend not very char uh, credit um charitably and the people about washington no doubt applaud 
applaud you for relieving them from the necess- necessity of giving by giving in the, from the necessity of giving by giving what was not yours to give the people have delegated to congress the constitution the by congress the constitution the power to do certain things to do these is to do these it is authorized to collect and pay money and for nothing else everything beyond this is usurpation and the violation of the constitution here you read I from there read. okay fine gee read it. it's almost it's done your idea so you see colonel you have violated the constitution in in what i consider a vital point it is a precedent it is a precedent fraught with danger to the country for the congress once for when congress once begins to stretch its power beyond the limit of the constitution there is no limit to it and no security for the people i have no doubt you you acted honestly but what does not that does not make it any better except as far as the as far as you are personally concerned and you see that i cannot vote for you i tell you i felt i felt streaked i saw if i if i should have opposed if i should have opposition and this man should go talking he would set others to talking in that district i was i was a gone I was gone fawn a skin I was gone fawn skin. I could not answer him and the fact is I was so fully convinced that he was right I did not want to but I must satisfy but I must satisfy and I mu- and I said to him So this is what David uh, Crockett responded Well my friend you hit the nail upon the head when you said I when you said I had not sense enough to understand the Constitution, I intended to be guided. I intended to be guided by it, and thought I had studied it fully. I have heard many speeches in Congress about the power of Congress, but when you what you have said here at your plow has gotten more hard sound has gotten more hard sound sense in it than any fine speech any than all the fine speeches I have ever heard. If I had ever taken the view of it that you have, if I had ever taken the view of it that you have, I would have put my head into a fire before I would have given the vote that vote. And if you will forgive me and vote for me again, if I ever vote for another unconstitutional law, I wish I shall be, I wish I may be shot. He laughed and replied, he laughingly replied, "Yes, Colonel, you have sworn to that once before, but I will trust you again upon one condition. You say that you, you say that you, are convinced that your vote was wrong. Your acknowledgement of it will do more good than beating, than beating you for it. If you, it, <laughs> hell yeah, <laughs> if." As you go around the district, you tell people about the vote, and then you are you are satisfied it was wrong, and that you are satisfied it was wrong. I will not only vote for you, but will do what I can to keep down opposition, and perhaps I may exert some little influence in that way. And here's what Crockett said: If you don't mind, if you don't, if I don't, said I, I wish I may be shot. And and to convince you that I am in earnest in what I say, I will come back this way in a week or ten days. And if you will get up a gathering of the people, I will make a speech to them. Get a get a bar get up a barbecue, and I will pay for it. No, Colonel, we are not rich people in this section, but we have plenty of provisions to contribute for a barbecue. Hence. And some to spare for those who have none. The push of crops will be over in a few days, and when and we can then afford a day 
for a barbecue. This is Thursday. I will see you. I will see to, see to getting it up on Saturday week. Come to my house. Come to my house on Friday, and we will go together. And I promise you a very respectable crowd to see and hear you. Well, I will be there. I will be here, but not. But one thing more. Before I say goodbye, I must know your name. My name is Bun Bunce, not Horatio Bunce. Yes. Well, Mister Bunce. I never saw you before, though you say you have seen me, but I, but I know you very well. I am glad I have met you, and very proud that I may hope to have you for my friend. It was one of the luckiest hits of my life that I met him. He mingled but little with public, but was widely known for his remarkable intelligence. And incorruptible integrity, and for a heart, and for a heart brimful and running over the over with kindness, and benevolence, which showed themselves not to only in words, but which showed themselves not only in words, but acts. He was he was the oracle of the whole country around him and his fame had ex had extended far beyond the circles of his imme immediate acqu acquaintance though i had never met him before i had heard much of him but for the for this meeting it is very unlikely i should have had opposition and had been beaten one thing is certain no man can no man could stand could now stand up in that district under such a vote um, at that point um, at the at the appointed time I was at his house having told our our conversation to every um, to every crowd I had met and to every man I stayed all night with Every man I stayed all night with, I, and I found that it gave the people an interest and confidence in me strong, stronger than I had ever seen manifested before. Though I was considerably fatigued when I reached his house, and under ordin ordinary circumstances should have gone early to bed, I kept him up until midnight, talking about the principle, the principles and affairs of the govern uh, of government and got more real true knowledge of them than I had got in my all my life before. I have known and seen much of him since, for I respect him. Know that it no no that is not a word not the word. I reverence I reverence and love him. More than any living man and I, do, and I go to see him two or three times every year. And I will tell you, sir, if everyone who, pro, who professed to be a Christian lived and acted and enjoyed it as he does, the religion of Christ would take the world by storm. Oh, I gotta stop. If you guys, you think of the people that you know in your life, that make you better, those are the people that you, you value. Hold on to those relationships. Cherish them. Because they're important. Okay.
if everyone who professed to be a Christian lived and acted and enjoyed as enjoyed it as he does, the religion of Christ would take the world by storm. But to return to my story. The next morning we went to the barbecue and my and to my surprise found about a thousand <laughs> a thousand men there. I met a good many whom I had not known before, and they and my friends introduced me around until I had got pretty well acquainted at least at least they knew me. In due time notice was given that I would speak t- t- to them. They gathered around a st- they gathered up around a stand that had been erected. I opened my speech by saying, "Fellow citizens, I present myself before you today feeling like a new man. My eyes have lately been opened to truth, which ignorance or prudence or both had hitherto had heretofore hidden from my view." I feel that I can today offer you the ability to render offer you the ability to render you more valuable service than I have been able to render in, render before. I am here today more for the purpose of acknowledging my error than to seek your votes. That I should make this acknowledgement is due to my is due to myself as well as to you. Wherefore, uh, whether you will vote for me is a matter of your consideration only. I went on to tell them about the fire, the fire, and my vote for the appropriation, and then told them why I was satisfied I was wrong. I closed by saying, "And now, fellow citizens, it remains only for me to tell you." that the most that most of the speech you have listened to with so much interest was simply a repetition of the arguments by which your neighbor mr bunce re, um, convinced me of my error it is the best speech i have ever made in my life but he is entitled to the credit uh, he is entitled to the credit for it and now i hope i hope he is satisfied with his con with his con- with his convert and that he will be that he will get up here and tell you so he came up to the stand and said fellow citizens i afford it affords me great pleasure to comply with the request of colonel crockett i have always considered him a thoroughly honest man and i am satisfied that he will faithfully perform all that he has promised all that he has promised you today he went down and then and there went up from the crowd <laughs> there went up from the crowd shouts a great uh, shouts of shouts for davy crockett as his name never called for forth before i i am not much given to tears but i was taken with a choking then and felt some big drop drops rolling down my cheeks and i tell you that i tell you now that the mem- that the remembrance of those few words spoken by such by such a man and the honest heart sh- and the honest hearty shout sh- they produced is worth more to me than all the honors i ha- i have received and all the reputation i ha- i have ever made or ever shall make as a member of congress now sir concluded crockett you know why I made the speech yesterday. There is one thing now to which I shall call your attention. You remember that I proposed to give a week's pay. There are in the house many very wealthy men, men who think nothing of spending a week's pay, or a dozen of them, for dinner or wine party, or a wine party when they have something to accomplish by it. Some of those same men made beautiful speeches upon the great debt of gratitude which the, which the country owes, owed the deceased, a debt which could not be paid by money. 
and the insignificance and worthy and worthlessness of money particularly so insignificant a sum as ten thousand dollars when weighed against the honor of the nation yet not one of them responded to my protest pro my proposition money with them is nothing but trash when it is to come out of the people but it is the one great thing for which most of them are striving and many of them sacrifice honor integrity and justice to obtain it wonderful wish they were still that honest saying things like I hope I get shot or you can beat my ass mm -hmm. I put my head in a fire put my head in a fire I wish I wish that level of integrity was still I wish that level of integrity was alive still it is for some not in Congress not in Congress and throughout our society I don't believe it is as prevalent prevalent as it should be I agree but you know now you can be arrested and charged if you speak too harshly to them because they believe that they are a protected class that they're above and beyond us not as employees but as rulers And I think a big part of that problem is we, especially in D.C., in an effort to be fair and impartial and whatnot, they've pushed, they've pushed God out. We no longer try to legislate based based off of, you know, good, sound morals. They do it to appease their special interests and choose one group over another. They're doing everything exactly the opposite as that story is told. The exact opposite of how it should be done. That's why it's so important to stand and speak the truth to importune the government until they until they capitulate until they listen to what we have to say that's why it's so important to 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 rise and to say to speak to to exercise the the god-given right of our speech nobody can take from you no matter what they say you can say what you want there are consequences to your vo your 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 words there are consequences to your lack of words. The the Consequ consequences to your lack of words and actions is far worse than the consequences to speaking up and acting. And that's the thing is these rights are God given. The government doesn't give us the right to speak. Nobody can take that from you. They can cut out your tongue. They can beat you for what you say. They can kill you for what you say, but they can't stop you from saying it. I had this conversation with my daughter where she, she was saying, we're talking about swear words, you know? And she's like, she said something like, well, I can't say that. And I was like, well, you could. She, she, we we're talking about swear words. She's like, I can't say that. And I was like, you could. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm allowed to? And I was like, no, you'll get in trouble, but I can't stop you from it. And I'm not going to try to stop you from it. If you say something that's that's wrong or bad, you'll get in trouble for that. You'll be responsible for what you say. But nobody can stop you from saying what you have to say. That's your right from God. It's God-given. It's not the government doesn't provide you that right. The government doesn't give you that permission. Nobody can stop you from saying or thinking what you will. But there's, again, all things that we do have consequences. And all things that we don't do have consequences it's it, you can't just say oh i'll let somebody else take care of the the hard work or the heavy lifting because your your inaction has as mitch said 
has oftentimes has worse consequences than than the harsh consequences of action. You know, I I like to tell everybody that the law of physics applies to absolutely everything. That every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And that's true with absolutely everything. You make <laughs> you make a good choice. You make a bad choice. You act, you don't act. There's always those consequences to your actions. Good or bad. One of the interesting things is like in all forms of every form uh, that I can think of of moral structures has some form of like karma or you know consequence or there's there is something that that is this principle with just given different words throughout all sorts of throughout the whole world it's not it's not um, it's not unique because it's an eternal principle it's an eternal truth Thanks for joining us today. My departing words of wisdom. <laughs> um, as far as this week's tip on preparedness, um, study about how to how to make medicines and remedies from the herbs and other things that you can plant or find out in the wilderness. I just learned this last week that you can get aspirin from willow bark. I didn't know that until this week. But and your preparations and your things of that nature also help you to be more independent. Help you to be more free. The, the less you depend on the government and on society and on the big business, big pharma, big, big um, everything. everything, the less you depend on that, the more free you are. It's freeing. I can make this. I can do this on my own. I don't need somebody else. Independence is an all-encompassing thing. Then it's our choice to to participate in it. Thanks for thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week. This has been episode 7. Not Star Wars. <laughs> Not Star Wars. <laughs> I'm going to buy a lightsaber.